Good morning, Mercy. How are you? You awake yet? Good morning, Mercy. Good morning. How are you? Excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. All right. So, um, as Pastor Louise said, my name is Antoine Dustin, for those who have not had the pleasure of meeting. And I do uh, I have the privilege of serving on our board, as well as in youth ministry, and our myth. Excuse me, our men's ministry. Um, we call it our Men of Mercy Men's Fellowship that meets every second Saturday of the month. So we're going to uh, ramp that back up again here starting next month. We welcome you to come out 930. We break bread together. We talk about the Lord. We fellowship. Um, so the guys, you're welcome to come out. So a little bit about me for those who may not know. Um, I have the privilege of being married to my wife, Stacy for the last 21 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we are blessed to have two boys. Our oldest son is named Jalen. He is a sophomore at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and we literally just came back yesterday from dropping him off at school. We left on Thursday and came back yesterday, so I'm a little tired, uh, but that's okay. The Holy Spirit will, will push us through this. And then we also have our youngest son, Caleb, who's somewhere in here, I believe, and uh, he will be matriculating to the University of St. Thomas uh, as a freshman. And uh, so we're excited for him. We'll move him in uh, in a week and a half here. So a little bit about me, just, uh, just so you know. All right. I think one thing that's important for you to know is that I am an avid, long-time Chiefs fan. <laughs> Who said Boo. All right, so here's the thing. When someone says boo to the Chiefs, it's called they're a hater and they don't like success. <laughs> because the Chiefs is a model of success. They are winners. And I also say that to the chagrin of Pastor Gary, who's not here. Uh, he is an avid Ravens fan, and they always lose to the Chiefs. <laughs> now, he's not here, so don't tell him I said that because this might be the last time that he shares the pulpit with me. <laughs> so, anyway, also, as Pastor, uh, Pastor Jesse mentioned, uh, we, we do like participation, right? Our worship team, uh, please praise God for our worship team. That was a very uh, worshipful set, and I, I hope you felt that as I did. Um, I encourage you to speak back to me, call and response uh, if I say something that resonates with you, if I speak truth, which hopefully I am speaking truth today, you will say, amen. 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 That helps me a lot because uh, up here by myself under these lights, which are very bright, by the way, I feel lonely. <laughs> and so if, you're, if you are, are participating with me, I don't feel as alone, although God's got me. So, uh, but you feel free to participate freely. Amen. All right. So first test here. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. All right, you're good. We're good. All right. Pass the test. Awesome. Okay, so we have been traversing through the book of Psalms now. This is our seventh installation of this Psalms of Summer series. And I hope you've been blessed and encouraged by the messages. If you've missed any of them, I encourage you to go to our website and check them out. Uh, even if you have heard of them, go back and check them out again and be blessed a second time. It really has been quite, uh, quite a journey, and we encourage you to continue to, um, to listen to those psalms. I'm going to do something a little different to start here today. I am going to ground us in the book of Psalms. Before we get to Psalm 40, we're going to do some grounding and talk a little bit about what is the book of Psalms. It sits right in the middle of the Bible. It's 150 chapters, and it can be broken into five different books with distinct and specific themes throughout. So I'm going to top line what those themes are. And also, they can be correlated with the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So we'll see the relationship there as I walk through this briefly. So what is the book of Psalms? Great question. I'm glad you asked. It is a book of expressions filled with praise, worship, and confession to God. So book one consists of chapters 3 through 41. It is mainly written by David, and it is very similar to the book of Genesis, 
Many of the Psalms discuss humans as blessed, fallen, and redeemed by God, which is very similar to the book of Genesis, where it talks about how mankind was created, fell into sin, and was promised redemption. So that's book one. Book two consists of chapters 42 through 72, which is written by David and the sons of Korah, uh, similar to the book of Exodus. Exodus describes the nation of Israel, and many of the Psalms describes the nation as destroyed and recovered. And then book three consists of chapters 73 through 89, uh, mainly written by Saph or his descendants, and is similar to the book of Leviticus. The tabernacle and God's holiness is the predominant theme of Leviticus, and many of the Psalms discuss the temple of God's enthronement. So book four consists of chapters 90 through 106, written primarily by unknown authors, but is also very similar to the book of Numbers. This book talks about the relationship of the nation of Israel to surrounding nations, and these psalms often talk about the relationship of the nation of Israel to surrounding nations. Then last but certainly not least, uh, book five consists of chapters 107 through 150, And these are mainly written by David, once again, very similar to the book of Deuteronomy. God and his word is the main theme of Deuteronomy, and these psalms are anthems of praise and thanksgiving to God and his word. So today, we're going to focus on chapter 40, which is a psalm written by David, and it's part of book what? Book one. All right, you're paying attention. Cool. So we're going to talk about waiting patiently on the Lord with expectation. Waiting patiently on the Lord with expectation. So I mentioned Stacy, uh, my wife, for 21 years. So a few years ago during the pandemic, she blessed me, she blessed me with a bike. She bought me a bike, um, a pretty, pretty nice bike from what I understand. I'm not a bike enthusiast, but she bought me a bike. I took that as a sign of maybe I need to shed a few pounds. Um, <laughs> And there's truth in that. I, I could stand to lose some, some pounds. I'm working on it. You know? so, but anyway, she buys me this bike. I hadn't ridden a bike in quite some time. And so um, I get on the bike, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not very steady. I'm, I'm trying to steer it and, and not fall down and bruise my knee or break an ankle or something like that. So um, it took a while, but then muscle memory kicked in, and, and I was good. Can anyone relate to that? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit? OK. Good. I share that only for the sole purpose that I haven't done what I'm doing now in quite some time, and it might be a little unsteady in the beginning, <laughs> right? But it's okay. The Holy Spirit's got me, all right? So we're going we're to work through this. All right. So Psalm 40 consists of 17 verses, and we are going to read all 17. Uh, it's the beauty in God's Word, so I don't want to miss, I don't want you to miss anything in here. So let's see what David has to say. This is from the NLT. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come. As is written about me in the scriptures, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out, as you, O Lord, well know. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have talked about your faithfulness and saving power. I have told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. For the troubles around me, 
for troubles around me too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame. For they said, aha, we've got him now. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. And may those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. Amen? Amen. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my savior, O God, do not delay. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the psalmist, for David, for penning such a beautiful psalm. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us here this morning as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that your Holy Spirit will open up our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. Lord, use me as a vessel of truth. Make me small and make yourself big and help us to leave this place different than the way we came. Help us to be closer to you as a result of this psalm. Help us to be more like Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. So of these 17 verses, what are we seeing here? We see five main points, five main points. We're going to focus on patience, justice, excuse me, patience, trust, obedience, righteousness, and prayer. Patience, trust, obedience, righteousness, and prayer. Okay? So as we look to unpack this in the first set of verses here, verses 1 through 3, we see that God, um, that David is waiting or has waited with patience on God. And God has blessed him with a few things. It's yielded several things from his patience. One, being lifted out of despair. Two, God set his feet on solid ground. Three, God steadied him as he walked. And four, we see that God put a new song of praise in David's mouth. So waiting on the Lord produces fruit. That fruit sometimes means that we have to go through a season of trial. And oftentimes, we want to do everything in our power to avoid that. But sometimes that's exactly where God wants and needs us to be. And sometimes that's the only way he can actually get our attention. So I want to share a story about um, a friend of mine. And I'm going to say his name is Casey. Uh, It's not his name, but in case he's listening. um, I'm going to share a little story about, about Casey. So Casey is a strong believer in Christ. He is married and has six children. Uh, And Casey, unfortunately, fell on some hard times. He was battling some demons. Um, He, uh, unfortunately, had two DUIs. And as a result of that, he had to spend some time away from his family, a little over a year, roughly. Now, he saw his family on weekends, but for the most part, he was not in the home and not able to uh, be with his family. So, Casey, fortunately, being the strong believer that he is, He's recognizing that this is a season of trial. So he's trying to discern, what is God trying to teach me in this season? So a number of things that he was able to discern was selflessness, trust, um, and also um, selflessness, trust, and also being, just being and, and, and trusting in God for provision. So as he's doing this, he's, he's taking several steps. The first thing he did was he reached out to another uh, believer uh, and said, would you walk alongside me? Would you pray for me? Would you hold me accountable? And fortunately, that brother in Christ said, yes, I will do that, but I'm going to do you one better Not only am I going to walk alongside you, I'm going to bring several other believing men to do the same thing, okay? So he had a village that was coming alongside him while he was in the pit, right? And a year or so later, God brought him out of the pit of despair, okay? 
He set his feet on solid ground. He was reconciled with his family, but he was away for over a year. So think about it. It was kind of like my bike story. It's a little uneasy at first. I think his youngest was about three years old, so uh, she had to get used to dad being around all the time. But there was power in his willingness to be patient and willingness to accept that this is where God had him for some specific reason, right? We see, also, here's the thing. As God pulled him out of that pit of despair, Casey didn't stop doing the things that got him out of there. So he continued to walk alongside the brothers that were there with him when he was in the pit. He sought um, counseling, uh, for he and his wife, as they had to navigate through some of those challenges over that year and a half or so that they were apart. Um, God put a new song of praise in his mouth. So now what Casey does is he shares his story. It's a testimony now to bless other people. He shares that with no shame. He's like, this is where God had me, but here I am now, four years later, four years removed from that pit of despair, and now he's thriving and growing and continuing to worship God as a result. Amen? So James 5, 7 through 8 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Anybody watch the Olympics? Okay. It is amazing to see the gifts and the talents that God has blessed these athletes with. Amen? I mean, it's amazing to see some of the things that they're able to do. Did anyone happen to see the men's 4x100 relay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so for those of you who didn't have an opportunity to see it, I have a short one-minute clip to give you a sense of what happened. It's going to be so were these men patient <laughs> I would say not so when we're not patient we have results like that when we don't succeed and so it's super important that we are uh, being patient and truly waiting so as we move forward in, in verses 4 and 5 um, David really talks about trust he exhorts the blessed to, uh, of those who put their trust in God rather than turning to the arrogant uh, or those who follow false gods. He speaks about the incredible deeds of God, describing them as too numerous to recount. Trust is foundational in every relationship. When we put our trust in God, the foundation has been laid for us to then be able to trust in other aspects of our lives, personal, professional, family, work relations, neighbors, etc. Without that foundation in God, we will struggle in trust in other areas of our lives. And Proverbs 5, 3, 5 tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Trust is foundational. So kind of going back to the Olympics again, uh, did anyone happen to see the synchronized diving by chance? Synchronized diving. Okay, we had one, one person, two, two, two or three. Okay, we had a few people, all right. I kind of stumbled on it. I just happened to turn TV on, and they were there. And I'm watching this synchronized diving, which if you didn't see it, uh, uh, maybe uh, Google it and go on YouTube. It's amazing to see two divers come onto that plank at the same time, move forward, together on that plank, get to the end of it, jump in the air at the same time, do their flips at the same exact time, and then hit that water at the same time with very little splash. That's amazing to see. How in the world do they do that? What does it take? What does it take? It takes trust, but it also takes practice. I can't imagine how long it took them to do that. I'm thinking probably years, right? But the point is that trust takes practice. Trust takes practice. Um, 
So when you think about it, if you're struggling in certain areas of your life from a trust perspective, maybe you're having trust issues with family or friends, think about where you are in your trust with God. Are you practicing every day to trust him more and more? Are you trusting him more and more every day? Maybe it's something you can write on your Connect card as something to think about and maybe take action with if that's an area of struggle for you. As we move forward in verses 6 through 8, we see that David contrasts obedience with sacrifice. Obedience with sacrifice. He says and acknowledges that God doesn't take pleasure in sacrifices and offerings as much as he does in obedience and a humble heart. David's commitment to doing God's will and upholding his law is declared. So today, when you think about some of the things that we do, obviously we don't do sacrifices like back in biblical days, but we do certain rituals. Like one of those is what we're doing right now. We come to church um, often. We take Holy Communion. We pay tithes. All of these are good things, but they are empty if they're done for selfish reasons and not out of devotion or obedience to God. Who has children? So, if you have children, are you teaching your children to sacrifice or to be obedient? Hopefully, maybe a little bit of both, but the first and the foundation is obedience. We teach our children to be obedient, and that then allows us to teach them other things. Obedience is table stakes. We see in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel tells Saul that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We also see the Apostle Paul in Titus 3, 1. He reminds them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Jesus in human form, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, according to Philippians 2.8. So I was blessed to be raised by my mother and my grandparents. And my grandfather was a pastor, and he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, everything that he believed in came from a biblical perspective. And uh, being raised by him as my father figure... I learned very early on the importance of obedience. I also learned that when you are disobedient, there is consequences that you have to pay. And again, I will tell you, he's old school and no nonsense. I will just leave it at that and let you fill in the blanks. But I will tell you, that was foundational for me in my walk with Christ because it helped me to understand the importance of obedience to God And as a result of that, I have been able to um, grow in my walk and grow in my faith. But the foundation was laid with my grandparents and my mother pouring in the importance of, of obedience. Moving forward, we're looking at verses 9 through 10 now. And David proclaims God's righteousness, faithfulness, and salvation publicly without restraint. His commitment to openly sharing God's wondrous works is explicit. So the definition of explicit is clearly with details. Clearly with details. So it's interesting. So there are studies out there that show that we as human beings tend to share what is negative more so than positive. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to give you some examples here. So let's say that we go to a restaurant. And we have uh, this great dining experience. The, f- the food is wonderful. The service is wonderful. The ambiance is great. Um, and we just enjoy ourselves. And then, you know, we go home. Maybe the next day we see some friends. Or the same day we see some friends. And we tell them about our experience. Studies say that we will tell probably three or four people about that experience. Contrast that with, let's say we have the opposite experience, that... The food's not good, the service is terrible, and the ambiance is not great. Studies tells us that we're going to tell that story three to six times more than the good study, the the good uh, experience. Why is that? Why do we do that? Take the news cycle, for instance, right? We have a 30-minute news cycle, 
let's just say, five minutes worth of commercials. We got 23 minutes of the anchor telling us everything bad in the world, everything negative that's going on. And then, if we're lucky, 90 seconds to maybe two minutes at the end of that news cycle, we get something good that's happening in the world. Does that mean that there's only 90 seconds to two minutes of good things happening in our world? Absolutely not. So why is negativity perpetrated so much? Right? It's all about ratings. And again, those same studies tell us that in order to get ratings, we have to talk about things that are not good. I encourage us as believers to be countercultural. Let's be like David, right? Let's share the good news. Let's talk about what is happening uh, with us explicitly. Amen? Amen? Every day, God blesses us in some form or fashion. Every day, we should have a new song and share what is happening, right? We should resist sharing all the negativity. We know what's around us. We're not ignoring it. But why perpetrate it? Why not be like David and talk about the good? Give God the glory. Talk about the wonderful things that he's doing in your life. And we can do that every day. Because God blesses us how often? Every day. Right? There's an opportunity to share God's glory every day explicitly. So as we look at verses 11 through 17... Uh, David implores God's mercy and steadfast love to protect him. His confessions of personal struggles and sins reveal his human vulnerability. And despite his shortcomings, he continues to trust firmly in God. This psalm concludes with David praising God and asking him for swift judgment against his enemies and adversaries. So we know there's power in prayer, right? All right, we see this all throughout Scripture. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. Uh, we see that in, in Philippians 4, 6, Paul exhorts us to not worry about anything, but rather pray about everything. We see also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, um, it tells us to pray without ceasing. Right, right? We know also in James that faith without works is dead. So you can correlate that with our prayer life. If we are praying without expectation, that's an empty prayer. We should be praying with expectation. Expectation that God's going to answer our prayers. He may not answer it exactly when you want him to or the way you want him to, but guess what? He knows better than we do. And so trusting in the idea and the thought that God will answer our prayer is something that we should do as believers in him. So Psalm 40 really is very powerful. It's a heartfelt prayer and praise. Uh, David brings to life his unwavering trust in God's deliverance in the midst of distressing situations. He also talks about steadfast faith, patience, trust, obedience, righteousness, and praise through the power of prayer. So, we've talked about a few things here. So what? Now what? All right? Um, so here's the thing. I'm going to propose six questions for you to ponder, okay? And you're probably thinking, that's a lot. Well, there's 17 verses, so yeah, it is a lot. But here's the thing. I'm not asking you to focus on all six. What I'm asking you to do is pray for the Holy Spirit's guiding you to where of these six questions he wants you to focus on for the week. It could be one, it could be two, but not to focus on all six. And, and feel free to take, take a picture of these. I will read them for you. What does Psalm 40 teach us about patience during difficult times? How can the metaphor of the pit and the rock apply to your life experiences? What does it mean to sing a new song as David did in verses one through three, and as my friend Casey uh, did as God pulled him out of that pit. He had a new song in his heart, and he shares that. How should we respond when God delivers us from distress? Should we hold it? Should we keep it to ourselves? Or should we be like David and share it explicitly? How can this psalm inspire a stronger relationship between you and God? 
And how can these themes of patience, trust, obedience, righteousness, and prayer apply to your life today? Okay? So again, just one or maybe two of these, and you can write those down on your Connect card. You can turn those in, and our leaders will be praying for you throughout the week and asking the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart as to what to do, be, or know about Psalm 40. Sometimes our messages aren't about doing. Uh, also, but we think about that oftentimes, like, what should I do with this? Sometimes it's not about doing anything. Sometimes it's trusting in the finished work of the cross. Sometimes it's just knowing. Sometimes it's just being. But we're all on different paths and different journeys in our, in our faith walk with Christ. So, so this message may resonate differently with you than from others. And that's okay. That's how the Holy Spirit works. And so we encourage you to make a note, to write this down, and meditate on this throughout the week, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you as to what to do, to know, or to be with Psalm 40. I'm going to invite the worship team up, and as they're coming up, <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with this. So, God is good. And all the time? God is good. Amen. You all are fantastic. He is loving, he's merciful, he's faithful, and so much more. We should be encouraged to wait on him patiently with expectation to invite long-suffering. Yeah, I said it, invite long-suffering. That's crazy. Not run from it, but invite it. Think about it, right? If we know that inviting long-suffering is going to be a blessing to us, and that we're going to be closer to God, why would we reject that? And here's the thing. Your long-suffering is not a solo mission. It's just like Casey and those brothers come alongside of him, and they were in the pit with him, right? So he didn't have to be there alone. On the other side of that pit and being brought out of that is a blessing. And so we invite long-suffering. And because we know that we should be singing praises explicitly, openly, and we know that God is worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. So wait patiently on the Lord and trust in his provision for your life and expect to be blessed. Expect to be blessed. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you are a God who hears, uh, a God who sees, a God who blesses, uh, a God who... Um, who trusts, who wants trust, a God who wants a relationship with your people. So we thank you, we're thankful for, for this psalm, Lord, and, and we look forward to your Holy Spirit ministering to us throughout this week, guiding us and leading us as to what to take away from this beautifully written psalm by David. We are grateful for this opportunity to gather, worship you. We're thankful for our worship team. We're thankful for all those who serve you each and every day. We love you, we thank you, and we ask these blessings in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.